I have a tendency to speak too much, so I'm going to work really clearly here on keeping it to eight minutes, but I do need to open with saying how honored I am to be here, uh, honored to be in your presence and courage and honesty and commitment, um, and I also need to, to also say that I am in the presence of two of my heroes as well, Drs. Wolko and McClellan. I also teach at uh, local universities, and I have utilized your science over and over again, and hopefully the pebbles in the pond are working, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, my reason for participating today, I believe, is because I'm representing treatment provision. And um, let me see here. Make sure I get that. There you go. Yep. Um, I'm representing treatment provision and the impact that collateral consequence has had on our ability to take that science that we've had for a long time now, it's, it's rapidly evolving, but we've had it for a while, to take that science and to put it into practice in treatment facilities where it can be effective for people. Um, so, whoops, let's see what I'm doing here. I, just briefly, so those of you that wonder what's Kodak and why might that be important here today, is that um, Kodak has been actually providing services for 43 years. 39 of those years, Kodak has been providing opioid treatment. Um, real experts in utilizing pharmacological interventions in terms of um, medications like methadone, currently buprenorphine, as well as non-pharmacological interventions. We really believe that every single person that walks through our door deserves what their individual needs reflect. Um, we have moved so far beyond the cookie cutter age that everything, the same thing works for everyone because it doesn't. Uh, and the five sites in Rhode Island reflecting the urban core to rural populations and is an example of that. And at any given time, we're servicing 2,000 individuals and their families. I want to look at Rhode Island a little bit as a microcosm. We're a, a tiny, tiny state, a little over a million people. And, um, but unfortunately, we've had some of the highest rates of deaths due to overdose in the country in 2014. Um, tragedy after tragedy. We have some of the highest rates of substance abuse among adults and adolescents, and we're the t in the top three states for DWI and DWI-related fatalities. We have our work cut out for us in Rhode Island. Over the last decade, again, these uh, just coming from Centers for Disease Control, over the last decade, Rhode Island has been among the top 10 in the country for substance use disorders in multiple categories. We're often in the top three. Before we get into the challenges, I would really like to talk about something that has worked, and inter because things do work. We had an intervention in Rhode Island in response to the overdose epidemic that has shown success. These, the figures speak for themselves. Um, I won't take time to read them. What is most important is that um, over deaths due to overdose doubled in 2014. What happened next? What was the effect of intervention? Was that the state collaborated, state heads came together and collaborated. Emergency regulation was put into place. Between January and March, the astronomical number of overdose deaths called everyone's attention. And we had people that had the influence come together and say, we need to do something about that. So regulation was actually pushed through that required residential treatment facilities to provide something called Narcan education and Narcan kits to everyone who would be leaving and their families. Um, Narcan, for those of you that don't know, is a naloxone product. It simply means that when administered, it reverses the effect of an overdose and buys people time to get to medical services that they're going to need, okay? What was exciting about this, this um, event that happened, this, this collaboration, is that if you look at that, look at all the people that came together, folks that would often be at odds relative to uh, budget and funding. We had our Department of Health, emergency departments, our soda, uh, first responders, law enforcement, communities, providers, and we had the media. The media was not there for sensationalism. The media was there to help us motivate and bring together the communities, to educate the communities. And it's still an ongoing effort. 
dollars and resources were allocated. However, we didn't have a lot of extra dollars. This was last minute. There weren't any budgets to run to and get new budgets made. So just about everybody on that list said we will reallocate individually, systemically. And naloxone trainings and kits were provided to that list of folks, including college campus staff, security staff, resident assistants, any organization in the state that wanted to have access to this had access. Outcome. Um, the numbers went, uh, decreased dramatically until there were no deaths in May and June. There were no tragic losses in May and June. There have been increases monthly since, but it has never reached the level of January, February, March, and April of 2014 in Rhode Island. It has not reached that, and the Loxone administrations continue to increase. So what's important here is that education, collaboration, and mobilization can happen. It happened in Rhode Island, and we're seeing the outcome of that right now. If we can do it for this, we can do it for other aspects of this epidemic. So there, we have something that works. I'm going to move into the challenges because I, knowing who I was following, I knew that I wanted to talk more to some of the global things that we face as treatment providers. And some of the global conceptions are the real challenges that, that we're facing in getting adequate funding, in initiating and maintaining and monitoring and teaching evidence-based practices, doing it with integrity, having the dollars to do follow-up, having the dollars to do follow-up with family. So the challenge is a general lack of understanding of the science of substance abuse disorders and related best practice. No matter how many, how many PowerPoint presentations we do, we are usually preaching to the choir when we provide them. How do we get that information out there? As treatment providers, it's part of our mission. Third, second challenge is lack of understanding that the disease is systemic, intrapersonal. And I would challenge you to think about this. If you woke up every morning and in an effort to find some peace in your life, you had to make a choice to engage in behaviors that went against your values. Every morning you had that choice. What starts to happen, okay? It becomes heart-wrenching. It's soul eroding, and eventually it becomes the cause of many co-occurring disorders, anxiety, depression, and we see that co-occurrence frequently. And I really would challenge you sometime, not now, but sometime to think about what the, think back to when you may have had to make a really hard choice, and think about if you had to do that every day. It, so the intrapersonal component, that fragmentation, is a huge healing for, for folks. And then there's the interpersonal. What happens to my relationships? I'm isolating from healing relationships, and I'm engaging in relationships that are helping support my disease. And then there's the family. The relationships, everybody's struggling. There's this mysterious, frightening event in our lives that's threatening our very core, and how many families have uh, come together with the skills to address that? And the third piece is there, once, once we've accomplished the two, if we do, there is also a lack of understanding of the importance that recovery requires a continuum of ever-changing supports. When someone comes to us for care, they have a certain set of needs. Six months later, that need, those needs will be different. Twelve months and twelve years, though, will be different. And it's our responsibility as treatment providers and as those who care about what's happening to be able to say, we understand that. We understand that there is that ever-changing need for support. So with these challenges, we've had some, some results. Uh, we've spent a great deal of time talking about those, the results that, the collateral consequences that are legal, but it, there's also other um, results, high community cross costs across the board in terms of law enforcement, corrections, criminal justice, child protective services, health care, mental health care. And what isn't up there, um, and I really need to stress, and I hope you can hear me, is that 
a tremendous loss of human resource. When someone is engaged, and when someone is led by their disease, their creativity, what they can, their love, their commitment to a community is not available. And that is a tremendous loss. Another result is that we create a system that creates barriers to treatment. I've named a few here. They were the ones that you know, are referenced most frequently. Access is a problem because of un or more frequently now underinsured, uh, high deductibles, co-pays, limited benefit. Uh, you know, it's an outpatient facility. You can see someone eight times, twice a year. And yeah, that was just a recent one that came across my desk. Uh, transportation. Stigma of accessing treatment. There's a real stigma still of accessing treatment. Um, child care. We also have a capacity issue now in terms of uh, workforce decline again, and that speaks directly to reimbursement rates and allowable funding for treatment care. Um, supports, there is lacking in supports, and we all know this, we've talked about it before, but safe housing, we know how that can be precluded, that's uh, through uh, criminal, criminal background. Education, employment, and really, really important, substance use informed medical care and other behavioral health care. Um, there is a tremendous need and a responsibility for, sub for treatment providers to reach out and work with, with the medical field, the rest of the medical field and the mental health field, and do everything that we can to assist people in becoming informed so that these services are not in three buckets, but it is an integrated effort to help someone with their disease. Only a couple more here. So who does, we said we, what's not understood, who needs to understand? And we've touched, we've, many of you have already touched on this, so I'm just gonna bring it together from a treatment provision perspective. Lawmakers who create the budgets and, and allow us some of our funding. Laws reflecting rehabilitation focus. And even stigma, uh, as, as was stated earlier, as Carol said, we've been doing methadone treatment for decades now. And methadone treatment is one of the most highly regulated treatments anywhere. <laughs> I'm not even going to get into the details. I do like a three hour rant on that that I don't think anybody wants to hear. And um, it is absolutely at this point regulatory stigma because some of those regulations actually create a barrier to people getting what they need. They actually create a barrier to people getting what they need. Payers and funders, again, we've talked about this, the long-term versus the short-term. Uh, I put the Oregon report here. I think this was a 2009 report. If any of you would want to see a really well-done cost-benefit analysis, the, the state of Oregon did a phenomenal job. And if you ever need, so um, again, I actually have my email address up there. If anybody wants to have any resources at all, please feel free to contact me. But it is a great resource when you're out there talking to folks. Um, treatment providers. Not all treatment providers understand best practice. Not all treatment providers believe in an outcome-oriented provision of treatment. Social service providers, we need, they need to be adequate supports, again, without judgment. Uh, criminal justice, I think we've really spoken a great deal about. Medical community, it's our responsibility to collaborate with them and start to offset some of the perceived risks and individuals and families seeking care. This is, all, this is all trickling down so that when someone finally walks through the door to ask for help, they're not even, they, they've incorporated the stigma. They're not even sure recovery and healing is possible. So we need to get that out there. And what, under, whoops, sorry, what undermines this lack of, of understanding is stigma. Set a negative, often inaccurate beliefs, you got it, set of inaccurate, beliefs that a society or a group of people have about something, okay? So what do we have here? We have stigma-based beliefs that you referenced earlier. You have the lack of understanding in the three really important places, and then we have substance use disorders are indicative of weak character, relapse and recovery are indicative of strength of, or willpower, and where else in medicine, as you referenced earlier, does a practitioner or a third party payer say that because the patient exhibits a symptom of their disease, they should no longer receive treatment? Where does that happen? It doesn't. 
I got one more. I got, I got to get you one more here. <laughs> because it, I, ugh. so, uh, what do we do? Addressing stigma for ongoing culture change. These are pretty self-explanatory. More forums of this nature, talking to the people that care, talking to people that have influence is really, really crit critical. And lastly, <laughs> um, as I said earlier, any references, specific citations, topic specific PowerPoint presentations, please contact me. I'd be happy to, to um, send you anything you need. And most importantly, I would like to thank the senators, um, White House, Portman, AO, um, for this wonderful bill and for everyone for being here. Uh, because this is a step, it's an important step in a movement towards saving important tax dollars, community dollars and resources, saving families, and most importantly, saving jobs. Uh, jobs, I had jobs written here. Isn't that great? You want to save jobs. Most importantly, that, that one minute thing threw me off, guys. <laughs> no, it's fine. But most importantly, it really is saving lives. Coming off the overdose prevention piece that Rhode Island has been through and we have experienced firsthand as providers is this is a bill that can help save lives. So thank you. Thank you.